Hi, my name is Elliot Harrison Lee. I'm a member of the Gender Spectrum Youth Council. And today I'm here with Jay Mace III, who is a writer and advocate. And do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, thank you, number one. Thank you for having me, Elliot. Um, so yeah, so my name is Jay Mace, and I uh, run an organization called Awkward, which seeks to uplift the work of trans and queer folks of color, specifically, uh, through the arts and through performance and all of that. And I have a lot of do a lot of nerdy things around faith. So right now I'm also the co-editor for a project called The Black Trans Prayer Book. Awesome. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about religion and faith and being trans and how that all intersects. Um, so to start off, uh, first question, I think for a lot of young people in the process of figuring out their gender or their identity, they might feel like they have to choose between faith and their identity, or like there isn't really a space to be both. Um, and obviously everyone's experiences are different, but do you have any advice for young trans people who feel like they have to choose? Yeah, so one thing I would say to young trans folks uh, is that I don't know a faith tradition that doesn't have different denominations, right? So, there's, so that lots of different people who follow similar paths still argue about what it means to connect with creator, with God, with universe, with all those different things. And so just because someone in your tradition told you something about what your relationship is, that doesn't mean that that has to be true for you, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say that there's always room for us to be able to interpret and experience our faith from an authentic space. Yeah. Um, what was it like for you to reclaim your faith as a trans person, as a person of color? Mm -hmm. So for me, I came up as a, in a household where I had a parent who was from the Nation of Islam and a parent who was Baptist. So both those traditions to me, I think, are ones that are very rooted in Black liberation. I think they're ones very rooted in activism. And when I came out, I also learned about how people pray very differently <laughs> across faith traditions. So for me, the ways that we learned Christianity in my household was from a very passive place in the sense that you go to church, someone tells you what to believe at the pulpit, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, or whether or not it actually relates to your life, and you believe them, right? So when I came out, I got lots of different flack around what my journey was supposed to look like. I've been exercised a number of times. It still hasn't worked. <laughs> like, there's no demons that have expelled from my body. I'm still trans, right? Uh, when I came out on my Muslim side, and I said, you know, these are my this is my name, these are my pronouns now, uh, which I didn't say my pronouns earlier, they're he and his. Um, but so when I said those things, you know, we'd always learned on that side of my family in our house and the ways that we practiced Islam was that you're always on an individual path to God. And so that no one else can tell you what your journey looks like. And so that was actually a much easier process. I stepped away from faith for a long time because of the interaction that I was having around the Christian side very strongly. You know, that was the side that was definitely that came up the most and most aggressively, I think, around what your religion is supposed to look like. So I came back into faith actually after I started working at a queer youth center. And I ended up, you know, when you're working with trans and queer young people, what we know unfortunately is that that also means you're working with lots of homeless young people. It means you're working with lots of young people who are put in very precarious situations based off of adults who intellectually know how to care for others, but you know, have some different blocks. And so I started having a lot of cultural conversations about, you know, culturally competent conversations with people about what their block was and accepting young people. And it was around faith. And so I came into it by uh, having to really delve into scripture, having to really have hard conversations that maybe some of my other staffers, other people maybe weren't comfortable with, you know, um, but I felt really committed to and called to do. And so that actually kind of put me back in that spirit. And once I found this idea, are you familiar with the concept of liberation in theology, Ellie? Mm -hmm. So usually for most of our conversations around faith, especially when it comes to trans and queer people, 95% of them are from this framework of defensive theology. So when we look at Christianity, Judaism, Islam, there's about six to seven scriptures that people generally use. There's only six, six to seven max about all those texts that people tend to use consistently to say like, oh, trans or queer people are bad, you know? <laughs> and so the problem with staying in those defensive theology conversations is if you win an argument, like if I say Leviticus doesn't actually say that it's against um, gay people, at best, it's a scripture that has nothing to do with us, right? At worst, I am in a long conversation with a bigot who doesn't see me as a human being, right? <laughs> so that's actually not a conversation what I wanna have. 
I want to have the liberation theology conversation, which is what I discovered as I was doing more of my own research. But so liberation theology is one that says, since we've, you know, we were created from the beginning, we must also be in the text. And liberation theology seeks to find trans and queer affirming bodies in the text, as well as lots of other different types of liberation theologies that seek to dismantle power stuff. So yeah, so I think that's coming into it made me find lots of different nerdy stories about people like um, Yusuf, who's a character in the Quran and the Bible, um, who takes on some very gender non-conforming and trans faces. Um, yeah, as well as a bunch of other stuff. So I don't want to get too nerdy in that. No, we have limited no, time. No, no, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that answers that question. It does. Thank you. What is it like for you to be in a space that is affirming, that is inclusive, that is for you? Um, and why is that important? So when, for myself, that is, that is the difference between being resilient and not, right? So that's the difference between getting up in the morning or not. So for some people, and I think that we have really hard talks a lot, especially as trans people, that sometimes people don't understand why we even need to talk about religion at all. For some people, religion's not important, right? As far as their daily day life. For some of us, that is literally the only reason that we are keeping on the planet mm -hmm. is because we believe there is a purpose outside of ourselves that is connected to a spiritual realm, right? And so that has to be part of the conversation. That has to be also part of our cultural competency and analysis around how some people like, even when I said I, I stepped away from faith spaces and all that kind of stuff, church was still in my bones, right? Mm -hmm. So even going and having those things, those conversations, going, listening to the music, going, sitting there, listening to scripture, that was my every day. So I think that for me, it's a place in which I can be in all of my blackness, my transness, my Christian Islam hodgepodge existence and feel good. Mm -hmm. I think when we talk again about that, it's so important to talk about how it impacts us on a global scale when we talk about suicidality, right? People, no one can convince me that faith is in the ways that people, the houses that people are raised in, right? Because even if faith is not important to me, but it's important to my parents and they're putting all that kind of toxic stuff on me um, or my teachers that are putting toxic stuff on me or police officers that are putting toxic stuff on me or shelters that don't believe I serve a bed in that spot and putting toxic stuff on me. Right? So we can't say that even if I am not a religious person, that other people's religion and affirming spaces don't impact how I get to live my life, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's the difference between uh, resiliency around me as an individual choosing every day to live. I think it's the difference between whether or not people decide that I am worthy enough of a human being to live in their presence, right? And how they decide whether I'm deserving of a job or healthcare uh, or if I deserve to be locked away for standing on a corner as a black mm -hmm. trans person, all those things. So yeah, I think that being an affirming space around faith makes me also believe that people are serious when they talk about social justice. That when I go into yeah. affirming spaces that know even less about scripture than the people that supposedly hate me on the other side, right? I feel disappointment and I feel like it's not a place truly invested in my liberation. Yeah. Um, I agree, and I feel the same way uh, for a lot of things. And I think also um, being in a space that is a space for me and also a religious space is what actually allows me to access religion, um, and which you, you, you said. Um, but, and then also the ability to just be myself mm. without having to prove myself, which in an ideal world I wouldn't have to. But um, yeah, I think spaces give me that ability to just feel safe. Um, part of me is like, wow, I, people just get to feel like this all the time sometimes. Um, Look, like there are people in the world that go yeah. for the whole day. And yeah, like, yeah. Fuck? You know, like just, oh my goodness. Yeah, um, so to experience yeah. that is important. I think it's important for everybody. And it's especially important for people who don't get to have it in their day-to-day -day life in spaces where most people exist. That's I think trying to explain to cis people sometimes the full body experience of what it means to be trans. Like I think yeah. if cis people had to experience what that looks like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. Kind of like, coming, like I can't not think about my transness going outside every day or, yeah. you know, um, traveling. I'm someone who has to travel for work. You know, I'm always in all kinds of random spots and 
trying to figure out who's calling me what at what time, you know, and where I'm going to be, if I'm going to talk today, if I'm going to be silent the entire trip. Even as someone yeah. who's been out, I've been out for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. I'm still making decisions about whether or not I'm vocal when I have to be on long trips by myself because I don't know what safety looks like. I don't know what all those things look like. And yeah. so our face spaces should be the number one spots looking out for us. And unfortunately, sometimes they're not. Yeah. Sometimes they think by virtue of them saying that they're of faith, that that's good enough. Mm -hmm. Right, well, that their intention again, when we know that there are systems that are out to kill us every single day, that those same systems that say they love us owe it to us to prove it. Yeah, and also, I think when you're in a world where you, where you have to be thinking about that all the time, where you have to, you have to be thinking, Am I safe right now? You know, what's happening right now? To be able to have a space where you don't have to constantly check to see what's going on, you don't, you, you know, that you're safe because you're in a space created by and for people who are like you, I think that's important for people to have. And I think it's, so even the conversation we had just like a little bit ago about like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't think about scripture like that. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine how much uh, more uh, expounded and more wide and varied people's understanding of, of analysis could be if they actually believe trans people's ability to read scripture? Yeah. Right? So it's like, it's not just about us. It also makes other people's faith better. Yeah. Because when you have a better analysis of actually digging into text, mm -hmm. digging into ceremony, digging into mm -hmm. all this stuff and looking at it from a place in which you were able to be honest about the world around you that was created <laughs> around yeah. you and how that is actually connected to the stuff that you're reading, you can be more better about, you can be even uh, stronger in, in your faith and your ability to live that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we just want smarter smarter analysis smarter faith spaces just, yeah that's it yeah smarter better bigger that's that's nothing that's it's nothing it's whatever <laughs>